Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest today is engineering legend Al Schmidt. First of all, Apple has just instituted a very interesting three-tier system of approved distributors for Apple Music. Now, this basically breaks down to preferred plus, preferred, and approved distributors. So what does a distributor mean? Well, that's the people that an indie record label, an indie artist would submit your tunes to in order to get it on Apple Music. Because as you well know, you can't actually submit directly to Apple Music. You have to use an independent distributor. Now, this is actually based on the number of tracks distributed to Apple Music in each quarter. So in other words, that determines which tier you're in. And it's also the level of service that's offered to users and the number of rejections that occur when music is pushed into the system. So you might not be aware, but content can be rejected based on the quality of the metadata, if it's not complete, for instance, if there's any copyright claims or if there's any publishing discrepancies. Basically, you have to have all the data there. It doesn't care so much about music or the quality of the music as it does care about everything else. So we have Preferred Plus, Preferred, and Approved. The Preferred Plus tier means that the distributor has submitted 40,000 titles, 40,000 songs per quarter. And there's only three of those. CD Baby qualifies, Contour New Media, which is a European distributor, and The Orchard, which is owned by Sony Music. Those are the only three that are approved for the Preferred Plus Now, in fact, there are 20 preferred distributors, and the qualifications are 10,000 songs per quarter. Among those are, I believe, Digital and DistroKid and TuneCore and a lot of others that are in other parts of the world. And finally, there's everybody else that's approved, and there's quite a number of those. I'd say there's about another 20 or 30. And again, these are mostly from services that are pretty much around the world, not so much here. So what does that mean exactly? You know, we don't know yet. It may be that there's some advantage going with the Preferred Plus member. This may be something that's more internal to Apple Music and distributors than it is to songwriters, musicians, artists, whatever. But it's worth taking a look at because Apple Music does things for a reason, and there has to be a good reason why they've differentiated between distributors. So keep an eye on this because this may be something that you can use to your advantage in the future. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. Don't forget about my online courses on mixing, production, branding, and music business success at bobbyosinskicourses.com. Also, get an expert analysis and objective opinion of your songs and mixes as a member of my Hitmakers Club. Go to hitmakersclub.com, all one word, to learn more. Now, Music Radar just had a very interesting article about the 10 greatest synthesizers. And synthesizers are interesting because there have been so many of them over the years, but there seems to be a golden age, and it's mostly in the 70s and 80s. Things haven't changed a huge amount since then. And as you'll see from these 10 that they've mentioned, most of them are from the 70s, and there's some from the 60s, but not that many. So... Number 10 is the Oberheim OBXA, and this was either a four or eight voice synth that was programmable, had a very, very big sound, and it was also one of the few instruments at the time that you could actually have presets. So in other words, all the parameters you can remember, that was a big deal at the time. There were a couple other versions of this. OB8 would have been my choice for this. That was the eight voice version that came after the OBXA That being said, all of these Oberheim OB-8s had a very distinct sound, and they deserve a place on this ranking. Number nine was the Roland JD-800. This was a time of samples being included in synthesizers. And with Roland, with this particular synth, they had very high-quality samples where most other synths at the time had, oh, pretty much 8-bit 
really noisy, distorted, quantized samples that weren't that good. But this also had a lot of real-time controls, which programmers really liked, but at the time, that wasn't a big selling point. Nonetheless, it had a really big influence because the technology from the JD-800 actually popped up on other synthesizers since then, as well as all of the Roland modules. Number eight comes in at the Yamaha CS80. Not many people saw CS80s, and the reason why, they were really expensive and they were huge at 200 pounds. But this was an eight-voice programmable synthesizer that had aftertouch, which was a big deal, had a very distinctive ring modulator, but the problem was it was very unstable. (laughs) If the temperature changed, everything drifted out, and it really wasn't that good of a synthesizer except for the fact that it had everything but the kitchen sink in it, and you could program up just about anything you wanted. So it was a programmer's dream, even though it was huge. It was portable, because it was made as a portable keyboard. But that being said, there wasn't too many of them around. Most of them go for premium prices now. I think the last one I saw was about ten grand. Number seven was the Korg Wave Station. What made this distinctive is it had a bunch of samples again, but these could be stacked and layered and filtered and processed. So that made it fairly cutting edge for its time. Its time was fairly short, but that being said, it did make a really big impression because this was an example of things to come. Number six is the Yamaha DX7. This basically was the sound of the early 80s, but it was very distinctive. It had 16 voices, which was a lot for the time. I think it was the most. It had aftertouch and a velocity keyboard. Again, big deals at the time because there weren't any other synthesizers, especially at the price for the $2,000 range that was in It was just an amazing deal. It was also based around FM synthesis, which was rather new at the time. To give you an idea about its popularity and about its historical significance, the electric piano sounds can still be found virtually everywhere. You hear a sample library, and there's always these DX7 sounds because they were so distinctive. And of course, what they were trying to do is emulate a Rhodes or a Wurlitzer and came up with something completely different but completely useful. Number five, the ARP 2600. This was interesting because it was a fixed signal path that you could change with a bunch of patch cords. So in other words, you could reroute just about anything to anywhere else if you had these patch cords. It had fairly stable oscillators, which was a big deal at the time, especially with Moog having unstable oscillators. But it was not programmable, couldn't be with the patch cords at the time, And it was really hard to repair because in order to keep the corporate secrets intact, all of the modules were encased in epoxy. So you couldn't really figure out what was going on and therefore you couldn't really repair it easily. However, there's a lot of great sounds. The one thing I remember specifically was if you listen to Suffragette City by David Bowie, all of what sounds like saxes at the end are all ARP 2600. Yeah, those aren't saxes. It's not Bowie playing it. It's ARP 2600. Number four was the PPG Wave 2.2 version number three. And this was a particularly big sounding synthesizer that had analog oscillators with very short digital waveforms that were compiled in a wavetable. It was cutting edge at the time. It also had some sampling. But the problem was it was really pricey at about $9,000 at the time. So you only saw them in studios for the most part, or in very, very uh, high-end artist rigs. That being said, today we can get roughly the same sounds through Waldorf, because Waldorf uses the same wavetable technology that was pioneered by PPG. Number three, the Sequential Circuits Prophet 5. This was totally groundbreaking and took the music world by storm almost overnight. It had five voices of polyphony, which at the time we were happy with one and two voices and all of a sudden here we have five. It could also store all the parameters. It could store your settings. This was revolutionary for the time. It was about 4,000 bucks, which was reasonable. It was within reach of most players or at least working players. And like I said before, it had a big effect on the songs of the time, where all of a sudden everything was featuring Prophet Fives. Now, the good news is Dave Smith, who was the founder of Sequential Circuits, just bought back the name, 
and has actually come out with the successor called The Prophet Six. If you want that sound again and more, look at The Prophet Six. Number two on the list was the EMS VCS-3. This was an English synthesizer that you didn't see much in the United States, but it was a big sound of the 70s, especially in English music. Um, The big one I can think of is uh, Pink Floyd, Dark Side the Moon, used the VCS-3 a lot. Also, The Who used the VCS-3 quite a bit. And this is very significant in the way it looks. It has a push pin modulation panel, which you know was something that was very unique, still is unique. But like I said, you didn't see too many of them outside of England and Europe. And what's the number one synthesizer? Well, according to Music Radar, it's the Moog Mini Moog. Many think that this has the best sounding filter ever. It also put synthesizers within reach of every musician because up until then you were buying modular synthesizers and putting them together so you didn't see that many of them especially on stage but the mini moog brought this to within the reach of the average musician which was a great thing it also sounded terrific but it was very unstable so anybody that ever had one knows that as the temperature changed so did the tuning that being said the mini moog is number one on the list And you won't get an argument from me over that. My guest today is one of the most revered recording engineers in the world today. Al Schmidt has won 22 Grammys, worked on 160 gold and platinum albums, and even received his own star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Al has worked with so many of the real legends of the music business, including Ray Charles, Miles Davis, Frank Sinatra, Sam Cooke, Jefferson Airplane, Jackson Brown, Neil Young, Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Kenny Rogers, Toto, Bob Dylan, Steely Dan, Barbara Streisand, Madonna, Michael Jackson, Diana Krall, Celine Dion, Paul McCartney, Michael Bublé, and hundreds more. His new book is called Al Schmidt on the Record, The Magic Behind the Music, was written with Maureen Droney and covers the six decades in the business. It even has a foreword written by Sir Paul McCartney himself. In the interview, we spoke about his book and some of the things that he didn't include in it, his favorite instrument to record, Functioning in the world without equalizers, the secret to keeping up with technology, the difference between vintage gear and what we have today, and much, much more. Al and I spoke via phone from his home in Los Angeles. Let's talk about the book, Why Now? <laughs> why now? I guess, why now? I, people kept asking me, God, you got to do a book. you got to do a book, Al. You know, and people kept doing it, so finally Marine Tony, uh, came to me and said, you know, there's so much interest in it, in a book and, uh, you know, I'd love to help you with it. And, and, uh, uh, you know, I love Maureen. And so we sat down, we'd sit down every Saturday, she'd come over to the house and we'd turn on the tape machine and, and just start talking, you know, and she'd ask me questions and, and that's how it came about. It took about a year and a half. And, uh, and now tomorrow is the day it's released, but, uh, it's already doing amazing so far, so we're kind of happy. Wow, that's awesome. Was there anything in the book difficult for you to write? In other words, difficult for you to put in there? Yeah, well, it wasn't difficult, but it, it brought back so many memories. Uh, you know, the the uh, dinner I had the last night with Sam Cooke was, uh, was kind of a tough one. To, you know, brought back a lot of memories, and that was tough to uh, get that done. Um, no, no, most of it was fairly easy to, uh, you know, it just kind of flowed out. I mean, there's a ton of stuff that's not in there, but, uh, you know, you can really do so much. And after the book came out, I really, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that, but, you know, shoulda, coulda, woulda. Yeah. Okay. Give me an example of something that you wish you would have put in there. Oh, well, some of the things that, uh, you know, some of the sessions when, you know, setting up and then realizing, uh, you know, the whole setup was wrong and how we had to just tear everything down quickly because the downbeat was in 10 minutes and try to reset the studio. Uh, things like that, that, you know, people talk to me about and, uh, you know, I'd bring up. And that, those are things I think were, would have been nice to get in there. And, and it would have been nice to talk about... Uh, just what it was like to work with some of my friends, 
not so much artists and all, but but friends, other engineers and and so forth. I think that would have been could have been a nice chapter. But it's too late now. I'm trying, I I think we're going to do an audio book, so uh, maybe I could sneak that stuff in the audio book. Some people have trouble working with their friends because there's sort of a competition there. Did that ever happen to you? No, no, no. With me, it's just it's always been just the opposite. Absolutely. No, never. Uh-uh. I enjoy working with people that, certainly people I like and respect. So, you know, it's never any competition. I'm not in competition with anybody anyway. Uh, you know, I do what I do. I just try to be the best I can be that day, and uh, and and that's it. So I don't, you know, I, I just... I don't um, grade my grade my work compared to anybody else's or anything else. What I do is what I do, and and that's it. Well, you're pretty much beyond that now. <laughs> you know, let's face it. <laughs> you know, after you've been around for a while and had the success that you've had, you no longer have to do that or worry about that. Yeah, well, I don't anymore. I mean, I, I, you know, I used to get a little nervous before the sessions, certainly when I first started. Uh, and especially with uh, doing sessions when I wasn't sure, like the first, you know, horn sessions and the first big string dates and then uh, uh, different uh, uh, kind of bands and so forth. And I get a little nervous before, but, you know, I've done it so much. And and the time that I spent at uh, radio recorders and RCA and uh, as an engineer, um, I did so many albums, uh, you know, back then you do an album in two days, you know, and I was working from, uh, nine to 12 and then two to five and then eight to 11. And that was six days a week. And we're just recording all the time. And this of course was in the sixties. And, uh, when, uh, it was music business heaven at that point, you know, everybody was buying records and, and everybody was recording. So, uh, you know, it was pretty cool. Uh, yeah, I, I just don't get nervous anymore because I've done everything. I have. I don't think there's an instrument in the world I haven't seen. That being said, is there one that's more difficult than another for you than the others? Uh, no. You know, getting a really good piano sound, I think, is is uh, tough and all. Uh, my favorite instrument to record, believe it or not, is an upright bass. Um, I, I just, you know, I never wanted to play the bass. But I just love the way the bass sounds. And uh, so I always strive to get a great bass sound. And, and uh, you know, I have a lot of bass players who are, are friends of mine and fans, you know, because I I work hard getting a great bass sound. And uh, it's not that it's difficult. It's just that I make sure every little detail is taken care of. I know there's a lot of ways to do that. What's your technique, if you don't mind? Yeah, no, no, I don't mind at all. My technique, uh, so to speak, is I, I use two M149s, Neumann M149s, and I love those because they've got a really nice top end to them uh, that I like, plus they get that great bass thing. I put one about 12, 14, 15 inches from the F-hole, and then I put the other mic up near the fingerboard about the same distance from where the guy's playing with his fingers. So I can pick up some of that, that articulation there. And then I take the two mics and I put them in summit limiters. But I just tap them like a DB. And I do it mainly because I just love the sound of the summits and that it gives the bass, the, the tube sound in there that gives it the bass. And that's it. Then I bring the faders up, make sure the uh, preamps are set and working right, and uh, I'm all for running. Let's go back to your book for a second. Was it difficult for you to remember the details of, you know, something that happened 40 years ago? Oh, yeah. I say this because having co-written the book with Ken Scott, I know that there were many situations where he just couldn't remember, and he would refer me to other people who were there, and we'd kind of collectively put the picture together of what really happened. Uh, so I'm just wondering how that worked with you. Yeah, for me, it was very difficult to uh, to do that because, uh, you know, trying to remember little details of things that happened and so forth, uh, it was tough. And, and 
and because there was no one else around back then, um, you didn't have an assistant. You were just the engineer who worked on it. And a lot of those people that early in my career that I worked with, uh, you know, are no longer in the business or they're gone. Uh, there was nobody to refer back to. So those things are not in the book. And, you know, it's like anything else. Uh, you know, you remember it later and say, oh, man, what did I get that in there? Yeah. You know, because that little detail of this little thing. And, and yeah, it's so... It was very hard to remember everything and all the details. Thank God for Maureen because she was able to get stuff out of me and she was able to look up things that, that I didn't remember. And there were some things, you know, thank God for the internet. There were some things she was able to track down that way. Was there something that she tracked down that completely had skipped your memory that you just hadn't thought about in years? Boy, that's hard to say. I can't remember offhand right now. Uh, that might be a good question for Maureen. Yeah. Um, she probably would know better than me. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's nothing I can remember right now. I wish I could. I can. You know, the, there was a situation when I was co-writing the uh, Ken Scott book where we were trying to figure out some things about Trident Studios, and no one could remember. And it turns out that a friend of mine, a former roadie of mine from way back in my early Pennsylvania days where I grew up, happened to be a Trident around the same time as Ken and had a picture. And there was a picture of oh, wow. Ken and Roy Thomas Baker in the control room of Trident, and there was a tape machine behind him. And I showed this picture to Ken, and he says, that can't be. We never had a tape machine in the control room. I said, well, look, here's the picture. Here's the proof, right? And he just could not remember, even though there was photographic proof. So it just goes to show you how, you know. He, I, well, I know exactly. You know, I love Ken, and I, but I know exactly what he was going through because I, it's the same way. And somebody said, well, here's a picture. Of, uh, I, God, I, I can't remember that. That's I just don't remember it like that, whatever it was. And uh, so I know where uh, Ken is coming from. Yeah. yeah. You know, we've been doing this, guys, I've been, you know, 60 years of making records. Um, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm lucky I remember my own name at this point, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, you, you memory little things slip by and so forth. So. Yeah, I have to read my own book to remember what I put in it. <laughs> well, you know, that begs a question then. So you've been doing this for a really long time, but yet you've been able to keep up with the technology where a lot of people can't, but you seem to roll with it with no problem. So what's the secret of that? The secret of that is having great assistance. You know, I've been blessed um, all my life, especially with as. You know, you know, Pro Tools and that started coming in. Uh, I've been blessed with working with like uh, Bill Smith, uh, was my assistant for seven years. Uh, Steve Jenowick, uh, my assistant now for 18, 20 years. Uh, I mean, these guys are all really on top of it. And they teach me little things and show me little things. And so I can get on Pro Tools and they set up dot one dot and that goes back to the beginning and I know how to go forward and I know how to reverse and how to find certain things. But if you ask me to go in and start tuning, forget it. I wouldn't know how to do it. You know, um, we, we never did any of those things earlier. So, so I'm blessed with working with, uh, you know, there's another guy at Capital Channel, I have that I work with a lot and, uh, you know, these guys are amazing and they, they know, my shortcomings and they just take care of it. They don't even talk to me about it. They just do it. So yeah, I'm blessed. You were so lucky to come up with some of the best equipment that was ever made, the best sounding equipment that was ever made and stuff that we look back on, you know, and revere. Is that the way you feel about it? Do you feel like modern gear is up to the task or have we gone past what was kind of like the best sound? Oh, no, no. I think some of it is really uh, up, up to the, the, the test of things. Uh, you know, there's, they're making some great microphones today uh, uh, that are amazing. Um, preamps that are amazing. Uh, consoles. I mean, the, I, I love working on the, the uh, Neve 88R. Um, yeah, no, I think, uh, I think we've been rolling along pretty well at a pretty good pace. The thing is, when I started, we didn't have equalizers and we didn't have compressors. 
So you had to learn how to do everything without those. So to get a brighter sound on the guitar, I used a brighter microphone uh, to use, you know, whatever I used on the drums to make sure I was getting a nice cymbal sound and all. I used a microphone that would do that. Um, so I learned how to use my microphones as equalizers pretty much. And, you know, I, um, you know, when, when the, all the two microphones started coming out, the quality of, was so great. And being able to take a microphone and put it from cardioid when you're listening to something and then put it in Omni and hear the difference of what happens to the mic and how it sounds because it's picking up ambience from the room and all. Um, I just I, I just don't ever use EQ. Uh, the only EQ I ever use, and even when I'm mixing, I don't use EQ except on the on the uh, on the bus when uh, you know the mix bus yeah. on the out, outside. I use uh, an API up there, I get air and a, and a tiny bottom thing, and that's it. Wow. So I could I could function very well in a world without equalizers. The only time I really use them is if I'm mixing somebody else's something that I got from somebody that maybe was recorded in a little dumpy little place or something or the sound, and then I may get in and start equalizing and try to. But I think equal when you put a lot of equalizing, you're changing the phasing yeah. all over the board and all, and it just it totally affects the way things sound. People say, God, your sound sounds so clear and so warm and all this shit. Well, maybe that's the secret. Try doing stuff without equalizing. See what you can come up with. Yeah, especially the generation coming up now. I don't know that they're taught that way or probably haven't been taught no, that way not. for a long time. Yeah. That uh, microphones are important in placement and the type of microphone that you're using. So, yeah, I could see that, definitely. Yeah, I agree. You just mentioned something that's interesting. So... How often do you go in and change a pattern on a microphone? Because it sounds like you're not afraid to go to Omni where, you know, a lot of engineers, they only use cardioid. They don't even think about that. Yeah, no, no. 90% of the microphones I use are in Omni. If I'm doing a big band session, I have five saxophones on the, uh, on the uh, five uh, mics on the saxophone. They're all in Omni. Five, four mics on the trumpets, they're all in Omni. I'm not worried about stuff leaking back and forth. That gives the depth to things. It gives an almost three-dimensional sound. So, no, um, I, I I use my mics in Omni quite a bit. In string dates, all my string mics are in Omni. All of them. Yeah, I, I just, it's the way I, I learned. And, and, you know, I I had set up a session one time where all the mics were in unidirectional and we had set them up and it just wasn't right to me and so I said to the assistant let's go out and change all this so we took the mic and put them all in Omni and the whole thing changed it was like somebody turned a light on and we were capturing all the warmth of the room and, and the, the air and it, it was like we looked at one another and that was it from then on you know I don't even I mean that's where I go. I put the mics up on, on big orchestra dates. They're all in Omni. But see, again, you're not afraid of leakage, and you, you use it to your benefit. Yeah, I embrace it. Yeah. There's a whole generation of engineers that don't look at it that way. They think, well, I want as much isolation as possible. When I go to mix with the masses in, in Europe all the time, and, and every, I go every year, and there's always 15 engineers from all over the world. You know, Singapore, Finland, China, um, South America, they come from all over. And they're all amazed at, at how we we do things and and, uh, and what I mix and how I set up things. And, and, you know, I'll get their mixes and we'll play it back and listen to it. And then I'll get the files and I'll put up the uh, a mix. And in 15, 20 minutes, I'll have a better mix than they have. And I'm not using any EQ. <laughs> so, you know, it's, they're all stunned by it, you know, they they stand there, they just shake their heads, you know, but they're in there with all these artifacts and all these plugins and trying to do, and and when you get rid of all that shit, it, it makes a big difference. Yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's it's worthless, 
uh, you know, because there are certain times when, uh, you know, a plug in equalizer might be just what you need to help ES something or whatever. Um, but, you know, I don't use plugins ever. I don't mix in the box. Um, and that's it. And if people that hire me know that, so they hire me for what I do, you know. How long do your mixes take? Oh, God. I, listen, I just mix it. I mixed a whole trio album with uh, uh, a jazz trio. I mixed the whole 11 songs in one day. Mm. Uh, you know, at the, we did 18 songs with the uh, Carpenters, and I mixed them in two weeks. Um, normally, I, I mix very fast. I, I usually can do two, sometimes three mixes a day, especially if it's something I recorded. Yeah, yeah. When I'm recording, I'm already figuring out what I'm going to do mixing. I place things where I'm going to put them in, in the mix and that kind of thing. So, you know, I make sure the levels are great, that there's a good balance. So you can take a ruler and put the faders up and, and have a pretty good mix. Now, that being said, you're picky about your ambience, though, the reverbs that you use. And I, I know you have favorites there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I use, you know, I love uh, the live uh, chambers at Capitol. I'm blessed that I get to use them. Uh, I, I love the Bacasti. Uh, it's great when I have an M6000. Uh, there's a 480 that I use. Um, trying to think of what else. Uh, oh, um, um, Tegan, it, it, is it? Yeah, the German company, they make a great echo. Tegan, I think it is. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they make they make a great reverb that I love. I've been using that a lot lately. So, uh, yeah, they make great stuff. So then, are you using different reverbs on different mix elements? Yeah, yeah. I try to I try to keep, you know, I try not to put more than two things in the same uh, reverb. You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a special, you know, the certain live chamber I use for strings, another live chamber that I'll use for vocals. And when my vocals, I'm usually using a live chamber and a Pocasti. And it's a combination of the two. And I tweak it until it just sounds the way I want it to sound, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Let's get back to your book again. Yeah. What's your favorite part of the book? Ooh, my favorite part of the book is the ending when everybody in the book is talking about what it's like to work with me. I think that's one of my favorites. Then, of course, how how not could you be a favorite part with Paul McCartney doing the forward in the book? Um, that was that was so cool. Working with Paul was really a quite an experience. Uh, the first time I worked with him, it, it was just I, I was so blown away by his talent. And, and the kind of person he is. I mean, it, it just doesn't get any nicer than Paul McCartney. He's just such a cool guy. Um, and it was so much fun making that record. So part of the book is that, and, you know, making the record, talking about that. And, it, and just reminiscing. I, you know, it was great uh, to... Um, Marie would bring something up, and I would... Uh, Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. And then I'd remember something and talk about what what it was. So those are some of my favorite parts because it made me remember back when those things were happening. You know, there are things in the book like when I, I worked with Sammy Davis. I did uh, What Kind of Fool Am I? I did a bunch of things with Sammy, and I loved him. And he was so much fun, to, you know, and, and it was always a contingent of people in the control room sitting around drinking and stuff and and having a good time. Uh, and, uh, you know, just when I did, uh, what kind of fool am I, I was on a Saturday and, uh, it's an interesting story because Marty Page was the arranger. Now I was the engineer and the producer of the record forgot there was a date. It was on a Saturday and he never showed up. <laughs> he got credit for doing it, but that's the way it came out. Yeah. Huh. I mean, that things like that happened quite a bit. There were also times when guys would come in, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to be a producer at at uh, at one point in my life was, uh, you know, guys would come in and be on the phone, mm. and they they weren't producing the record, or they they'd come in, they'd do a song or two and leave, and then the, the hit would be one that we did after they left. <laughs> um, so I thought, geez, these guys are getting all the credit and making all the money, and and 
and I'm doing all the work here. I might as well get in on that too. So that's when I made that transition from uh, from engineer to uh, to producer. And then at RCA, when I made that transition, I was not allowed to touch the board anymore because of the union problems. Wow. Wow. So uh, so I just stopped engineering for a period of time, almost six years. Wow. Uh, I was just producing. Did you burn out in producing? I did. I did burn out in producing. Uh, 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 Tommy LaPuma got me back. He he asked me, uh, he said, oh, you were a good engineer. With Bruce Bondick was, had, was working on this project with him, and Bruce had to leave to go to the doors. So he said, you were a good engineer. Will you mix the sour for me? And I said, oh, Tommy, I don't think I can do it anymore. He said, come on. It's like riding a bike. And we made a deal, and I went in and did it. And as I started putting the album together and mixing it, I thought, this is my first love. Why am I not doing this? Mm. You know, this is what I got into business for at all. And it was a Dave Mason record called Alone Together. Oh, I remember. And, uh, yeah. It was just a great, you know, great record, and, yeah. and it got me back into it. And then I realized I was, uh, you know, producing, you, you have to... Uh, you got to figure out a budget. If the artist doesn't write songs, you got to find songs for the artist. You got to um, uh, hire the musicians or hire a, an arranger and a contractor. And, and I mean, it's all falls on you. And then, uh, you know, if you're doing both, then you, you're engineering also. But at one point I wasn't doing both, but still it was so much work. And I had 11 artists that I was dealing with at RCA wow. and it just burned me out. And that's when I left and just started producing the uh, Jefferson Airplane. Yeah, we talked about the Jefferson Airplane once before. I, I remember asking you about that first album. Why is there so much reverb on it? And you said, well, I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was the engineer on it. Oh, the first album. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I did. Uh, the first album I did was Baxter. Ah, Maybe okay. Baxter. Yeah, I know. That's one of the, the reasons I wound up with the Airplane. Because they hated the way those records sounded. Yeah, there was just too much echo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on every day, and they and they and they when they tried to, uh, the producer was adamant and all, and and with me it was just the opposite. I was making their record, not my record. You know, you mentioned Paul McCartney before, and I'm curious because Paul, I would assume, is used to working one way, and he's come up in the Abbey Road EMI system. Was it any different when you worked with him? Did he ask you to do things that, that you weren't used to, or did he want to work with the way you do things? How did that work? Yeah, I know. He wanted to work with the way we did things, you know. Uh, uh, Tommy LaPuma and me and uh, Diana Carl was a big part of it. Uh, yeah, he, he put himself in our hands, so to speak, because... He had never made an album like this. He had always wanted to do a record like this. He wasn't even sure he could do it. And the first date we did was kind of an experimental date just to see if he was able to do it. And it took uh, maybe an hour or so, and then all of a sudden it just clicked. And bam, and he came out, and he would love to come in to control it because I'd have a good balance. I'd have a nice echo on the voice and everything. It'd sound almost like a record. And he'd come in and listen, and and you know, I'd see this smile on his face. And yeah, now and he realized he could do this. And you know, because when he was a kid, all his aunts and uncles would come over, or they'd go to one of their houses, and they'd roll up the rug, and they had a play a piano, and they would sing all these songs. The family would sit around, and everybody. And, he always wanted to do that. It was amazing uh, to watch that happen. And, uh, and you know, to watch him and, and that, I don't know how well you know Paul, but he gets a twinkle in his eye and, and you know that, that everything is right. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, it's really cool to watch him. Do you have a favorite part of your career? Oh, I guess, uh, you know, I loved it. <laughs> I was a bebopper, you know, and I loved, those. Was, that was a favorite favorite time in my career, you know, with Chet Baker and Jerry Mulligan and Sue Sims and, and uh, Charlie Parker and Lenny Tristano and all those great, those were the things I just loved because I used to pay a dollar when I was 16 and go to a club like the Royal Roost or Pop City uh, and those places just to hear these guys. And now all of a sudden, 
I'm in the same room recording them. Mm. It was like a dream. It's like when they were walking in, it's like watching Babe Ruth and Joe DiMaggio come into the control room, yeah. you know? Yeah. They were they just were my heroes. So that that was that's my favorite time, yeah. Oh, I love what I'm doing now. You know, I do a lot of big band things and orchestra things and all. Well, unfortunately, we're not doing a lot of jazz anymore. And we just lost Roy Hargrove yeah. and, uh, you know, jazz trumpet player. And uh, and I did a bunch of records with him, and, and they were always fun. I, do it just, I did one earful, which is just a uh, quintet, uh, trumpet sax and a bass, drums, and piano. Uh, the, the fabulous record. I just love that record. Uh, I did, recorded this big band. Uh, yeah, so... And Diana Carl is another one. I love, you know, she comes in with the rhythm section and and all the orchestrations are done later, but it's so much fun just at that particular time, you know, her, the piano, the, the, the musicians, and watching everybody play off everybody else and how they, they make their changes. And, and it's it's wonderful. You know, and when I, you know, some of these kids are making a record, the drummer's in the studio, the bass player's in Canarsie somewhere, uh, <laughs> the guitar player is in San Diego, <laughs> you know, that, I and mean, they're, they're not playing off one another. They're playing right what's there in front of them. Uh, but when everybody's in the studio, you can see the changes. The guy hears the guitar player, keyboard player, hears the guitar player, do a certain thing and he comes up does something that riffs off that that doesn't happen when you make your records one instrument at a time and uh i don't do those things fortunately and uh you know and it's just i love musicians i love to hang out with them i love when they come in i'm always out there with them chatting and seeing how everything is and talk to them about their, their instrument and what's the best sound and what do they like and you know, I try to make it fun for everybody, you know, not so hard stuff going on. And we, you know, I'm trying to get a drum sound for three hours. If I don't have a drum sound in 10 minutes, I'm never going to get it. You know, you mentioned something over and over while we've been talking, and it's how much fun you were having or how much fun the session was or how much fun a certain person was. And it seems like that's a central part of what you're doing. It's it's the most it's the best. I mean, I wouldn't do this if I wasn't uh, having fun. I, I tell people all the time, I lie to my wife, wife when I tell them I'm going to work. You know? I mean, I don't go to work. I go to play. You know, I go in there. I'm just hanging with people I like and people I love. I'm, I'm making music. Some of the music's going to affect the lives of millions of people around the world, you know, and bring joy to them and passion and, and things. So how the fuck can you not enjoy doing that? Yeah. Especially if you can do it, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, right, right. And you're still busy. You're still working on lots of stuff all the time. Yeah, I just finished the uh, the uh, mixing the Carpenters record uh, with the, the Carpenters with the uh, uh, London Symphony Orchestra, and it's uh, it'll be out December 7th. Mm. And uh, we kept Karen in the background, you know, reading the orchestra and all that, and uh, I mixed it all with, with the help of... Chandler Harrod and Steve Chenowick, you know, we we finally were able to get it done, and and it's, it's an amazing record. And Karen was one of the great singers of all time. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I I'm trying to stay busy. I'm I'm taking a little time off now because of the book. You know, I'm doing serious radio interviews and that kind of stuff. So I'm just kind of kicking back. I worked a lot this year. And I'm just relaxing. I, I have an album that I did with uh, Trisha Yearwood that'll be out, I think, in January. That's an amazing record. She sang a lot of the old Sinatra songs. And uh, uh, Vince Mendoza did the orchestrations with a 62-piece orchestra. And it's just a wonderful record. And then I, I finished Martina McBride's album that just, uh, just came out, I think. It's a Christmas album. And uh, so, yeah, life's good. <laughs> Last question, Al. What's the best piece of business advice that either you learned along the way or maybe somebody imparted to you? Well, business advice is to get a really good lawyer that you trust. 
that's that's the best thing I can advise you to do because if you leave it up to people, other people, or you say, yo, I don't care or whatever, you're going to get screwed out of a lot of money because I know I did, you know, I know along the way I got uh, where I thought I was getting points on things, was promised points on things, I never got them, and, and I had nothing written. I didn't have an attorney uh, take care of those things. So, yeah, that's one of the best things. And the other thing is follow your heart. Do what you love to do. You know, get in there and do what, what makes you happy. And if it's being a recording engineer or a record producer or a songwriter, you know, good luck. Do it. You can find out more about Al at alschmidtmusic.com, A-L Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-T-T, music.com, all one word. And his book is available from just about every bookseller, including Amazon. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyowinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyowinnercircle.com, or find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, Google Play, Google Podcasts, and now Spotify. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyowinnercircle.com, you also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts to new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time. <laughs>